Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. The principle of faunal succession, and I sort of hinted at this earlier when I was talking about Smith's discovery, that the fossils in layers always occur in particular order, that never get switched around. This is basically what the principle of faunal succession says. Organisms only live at certain times, and the organisms all living at the same time necessarily are going to only leave their traces in rocks produced at that time. They're living and dying during the period that their carcasses are being stored away in the rocks. And so faunal succession basically just, report, re basically just records that. It records the fact that if you look at a stratum that has a particular kind of trilobite fossil in it, and you know that above that usually you'll find an ammonite or, or a nautilus-type shell fossil in that rock, then wherever you find that trilobite, you know that if you look at rock above it, if it's still there, you'll find that. Faunal succession allows us to map strata and to predict its location and to predict where fossils will be. A key idea to reiterate here, too, is that, that when William Smith discovered faunal succession and popularized the idea in his maps, this was before Charles Darwin, long before, decades before Charles Darwin had published Origin of Species, so no one knew anything about evolution. William, had no, William Smith had no concept of evolutionary change, and he wasn't depending upon that understanding to map the geology of England. He was simply using the fossils as funny marks, and still they did the job. The principle of intrusive relationships. And that sounds dramatic, but what it really implies is the principle that if you're looking at a rock that has been intruded by some other rock, like a, a layer of, of magma that has burned and melted its way through at some point in the, in the deep past, when the rock itself was still deep within the earth, if you see an intrusion through another rock, then it's necessary that the intrusion itself is younger than the rock it is, in, is within. And this is a nice example here. This is igneous rock, the whole body of rock you're looking at. Uh, and this is in uh, Sweden. It's all igneous rock, but in the foreground, what you're seeing is there's this white vein material that, that runs off into the distance from the foreground. That's a vein of quartz rich. It's what we call a dike, an igneous dike, meaning essentially a wall of material that is oozed up, melting and burning its way through pre existing rock due to be, there being a fracture there. That'll, uh, and then it forms a new body of rock within the pre existing one. Now, we know that that, therefore, that white vein, that quartz rich dike, is younger than the volcanic rock around it. And that black vein of material, that black dike of darker volcanic, of darker igneous rock, the rock type is called dolerite, that stuff came in and intruded after the vein of quartz-rich rock had already been there. So we're looking at a history of the rock. We can tell the sequence of events. I can't tell you looking at it when it happened. This big mass of igneous rock we're looking at uh, was intruded by this quartz-rich vein of material, uh, molten stuff at the time. And then later on, this dark igneous rock came in and intruded across that. So this allows us to determine what's happening in a sequence of events. And it can get pretty complicated. The geometry of dikes and sills can be really weird. Dikes are basically, like I said, igneous rock intrusions into pre-existing rock. A dike, though, cuts across the rock layers. It cuts across the rock like you're looking at here. This is different from what's called a sill, the term that geologists use for an igneous intrusion in the deep subsurface that doesn't, caught, that doesn't cut across rock layers, but actually follows one. In this case, you're looking at a sill of igneous rock, again, a kind of dolerite, uh, that has intruded itself between sedimentary layers. Now, you're probably saying, look, I, and this is in Nova Scotia, Canada, and you're probably saying, look, I, didn't, didn't I just say that layers of rock, you apply the principle of superposition to, and there's a sequence of age. Yeah, except when something like this happens, when you have a mass of igneous rock that's, that's coming up from below and finds a layer of rock that's got a lower melting point, it's easy to melt through, and it just starts following the path of least resistance, which in this case spreads it out through a layer of rock that was already there and is now incorporated and assimilated into the, the melt that's coming in and intruding. That can happen. And it leaves pretty obvious signs. Uh, the rock surface above and below that sill shows evidence that the rock itself has been partially melted and heated and chemically altered when the intrusion occurred. So these things don't go without footprints. But looking at dikes and sills and being able to understand them in terms of relative age allows us to really uh, deconvolve some really complicated geology. Another principle that's highly useful is the principle of inclusions and components. And this is a pretty basic one too. The idea is that if you find a rock that's got something included in it, it's got another rock stuck in it, you're looking at a piece of lava rock that's in gray, and on the upper part of the diagram in green is a big inclusion. It's actually a piece of the mantle. So we call a xenolith. 
It's a chunk of mantle rock that got ripped off and scoured from the wall of the conduit of the lava as it's rising. And it's simply embedded in the lava when it pours out on the surface of the earth and freezes solid. And we can go pick it open and find these. So that's an inclusion. That means that that wall rock was there first. And it got picked up and moved by the lava. So the lava definitely is younger. And we can determine by absolute uh, dating techniques how, how, what their ages are. But we don't have to determine the relative fact that the xenolith was there and got incorporated into the rock. That's the principle of inclusions. Components is a little bit different, but basically still the same thing. It's the idea that if you're looking at a sedimentary rock like this sand from the Gobi Desert, it's not rock yet, but one day it might be. But it starts like this. And that means that a sedimentary rock, that it's, if it's made of bits of eroded rock from elsewhere, then obviously those bits of rock are older than the sedimentary rock that forms from them. And in fact, some of the oldest rock bits ever found on Earth are nothing more than small grains like this in a larger piece of rock because the grains themselves derive from an older piece of rock that eroded, was transported, and ended up there. The principle of cross-cutting relations. Simply stated, if a fault cuts through and displaces two parts of a rock body from each other laterally, like you see here, then that fault basically creates a cross-cutting relation. It cross-cuts the rock that was already there, so necessarily it's younger. Now, that being said, is pretty obvious, but the way this is most useful is if there's multiple faults in an area or multiple examples of the rock that has been cross-cut in different ways. By looking at how they overlap with each other, it's possible to deconvolve that and figure out what the sequence of events was. If you look at this block diagram here, this is the kind of thing that's used pretty commonly to teach geology. You can look at it and it's pretty complicated at first blush, but using this principle and the other principles I've already talked about, one could take apart what the sequence of events was there. For example, this dark green igneous dike in D clearly cuts across a lot of different things, including a deep intrusion, a bunch of folded rock that itself was originally laid down horizontally and then was folded later, and then a lot of this stuff happened to it, it eroded down, then obviously there are some sediments that are piling up on top of even that that uh, recent igneous dike. So cross-cutting relations is stated simply, but is actually a very subtle and, and useful concept to be able to understand large parts of the Earth's subsurface. Another way of assessing relative age that you really can't apply to Earth, actually, is counting craters. If you start with a new surface, it's not going to have any craters on it. As the surface ages, the surface of an object exposed to space like the moon, uh, with no real erosional processes to speak of, there's no wind, there's no water to move things around to erode, uh, then features can last a long time. So if you look at the moon, the older the surface is, the more craters it has. Craters will simply build up as impacts occur randomly as time stretches on. So you can look at the moon and you can tell the relative ages of the terrain because of how much cratering is. And craters on top of craters can also give you information about which craters were there first. If you look at something like and this is a useful way of determining the age of a surface. If you look at something like Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, its surface is water ice that's constantly shifting and jostling and, and being resurfaced with uh, fresh water from below that spouts out sometimes as geysers. So that's a very young surface, and you can look at it and you see that there's very few craters there. And what craters there are are mostly eroded because they've been slowly... There's not very many craters there. It's a young surface geologically speaking. And you can contrast this with something like Callisto. This is a moon of Jupiter. It's one of the big Galilean moons. Callisto is what we call saturated with craters. That is, anything that drops onto that surface, forms a crater, necessarily is going to be forming it on top of pre-existing craters, unavoidably. We think that's the oldest surface in the solar system. There's no geologic activity there. There's no resurfacing. There's no erosion. It just soaks up impacts. And it's got the oldest surface, as far as we can tell, in the solar system. As I said, craters, craters on craters allow us to assess uh, the su their superposition and relative age. You're looking here at the surface of Mercury, which is Mercury, uh, the surface of Mercury, the planet Mercury is covered in these what are called lobate scarps, basically cliffs. They happen as the planet cooled and its giant iron core solidified and shrank. So the mantle and crust outside of that had to buckle to compensate. So what you're looking at here are very old craters that themselves have been disturbed by the formation of that cliff. The crust is basically the, cl the crust is basically faulted there. And so you can in fact see craters on top of craters. That big crater that's split by the cliff 
itself has craters on top of it, one of them is also split by the cliff. So this allows us to determine relative ages of things. Earth's surface is constantly changing. Water, wind, tectonics, mountain building, all of these constantly alter the surface. So craters don't last very long on Earth. This is one of the oldest craters on Earth today. In fact, the Manicouagan impact structure. It's about 250 million years old and about 100 kilometers in diameter. It's up in Quebec. I actually saw it once when I was flying back from Europe. Uh, I could look down and just happen to be in the right place at the right time and you could see it plain as day. This is one of the few impact structures we have on Earth that have, has survived recognizably. This, a few others, of course, but not many. That's because our surface is constantly dynamically changing. On the moon, however, Mercury are a place without air, without water. Crater counting is pretty useful.